afternoon, everybody. How's uh, lunch so far? Good. Right. You guys right. want to, you two want to sit? You Thank you for coming today. Uh, we appreciate it. We're happy to see everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Olson. I'm the insurance agency manager for Client First Insurance Agency. And I'm privileged to welcome all of you on behalf of Client First uh, today's edu to our educational event that uh, True Holistic will be presenting for you um, titled Dr. Client's Needs Out of the Park. A little bit about our presenters today. So this is our True Holistic team, our planning team. And uh, as many of you already know, it's a, we have a great team of individuals to, to work with. Uh, they, they care, you know, they're, they're motivated to take care of you, uh, you know, as clients and, and take care of you and get to know you personally. So, and part of the reason, uh, and I hear that, we hear this a lot on the insurance team. Uh, I've heard it from clients several times, but things feel a little bit different working at, with client first and, uh, you know, in a good way in that, you know, we care a lot of, a lot of, you know, us outside of this business. And part of that is we have a set of core values that we live by as an organization through and through. And we make decisions around these, but they're, they're right on our website. They're posted up on our wall when you come in. But I uh, just wanted to highlight those briefly. So number one is we love our clients. We're fully committed to their financial well-being. Two, we are fiduciaries for our clients and believe the true holistic planning and adaptive investment management are the only ways to care for our clients' needs, financial help. We continually strive to be aware of opportunities to serve our clients better. And we expect to foster a culture of learning, performance, and exceeding expectations. Um, and then number five is we are a family of, uh, of families and recognizes the fullness of life beyond the office. So those are the values that we live by. And uh, as I said, number one is we love our clients. You know, we, we truly invest in our clients and getting to know them and things like that. And, and I think some of those, the theme I hear from clients is it does feel different here. Um, and that's, these are some of the reasons why. So I wanted to highlight that. The, um, the other item would be for today's presentation, being client focus, you know, that is kind of what grounds us to uh, continue serving our clients, you know, being aware of opportunities to make things better. So um, with that, I just wanted to just throw out some trivia for today before we get to Justin introducing the team here. Uh, it's around our our theme here, knocking clients' needs out of the park, baseball. And many of you know Brad on the planning team here is, <laughs> is an excellent golfer. Uh, many of you may not know that Brad played baseball in college at MSOE and was also a very talented baseball player. So a little trivia around that and uh, more of a guessing game because <laughs> many of you probably don't know this, but how many years did Brad's career RBI record hold um, at MSOE. So uh, I, won't, I won't give out the dates, but uh, I'll give you some choices here. Uh, the record was 98, and the choices are A, three years, B, 15 years, C, seven years, and D, 18 years. So who, raise your hand for three years, A, Okay, uh, 15 years, Three more, all right, seven years, okay, and then 18 years, all right, I think uh, the majority were around that seven years, but uh, it is actually D, 18 years. Wow. Yeah, so um, I think he's read enough now that we can... Uh, <laughs> Get it over to Justin here, but uh, just wanted to, you know, share how great this team is. Like I said, many of you know this already, but today they're going to talk about more how they do it. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Justin. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is, we like to always go through what's going on with our families, give an update. So this is the True Holistic Planning Team. So our outing uh, this summer is we went to a Brewer game uh, on a... Wednesday afternoon, and we had, was it 10 or 11 innings? We had a win that day. 10. 10 inning game. Um, so that was a lot of fun. All right. So my family, of course, it's summer, and the Krieger boys are fishing. So we have all the boys up there. We caught a bunch of bass on our trip up north. 
um, this summer. Uh, we, uh, the, my two uh, middle boys, we went to Canada. So those are the rest of the fish. So Asher caught his first muskie in Canada, also the first muskie of the trip. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. We caught 43 muskies. So, so there was 10 gentlemen and young men there, Asher being the youngest at age 10 at the time, turned 11 shortly after. Isaiah has a nice tiger muskie there, and I have a nice natural muskie there as well. So it was the summer. Um, in the summer up here, my daughter, who's a sophomore this year, Michaela, she got to go to Spain on a trip. So she had lots of fun, made new friends. Um, Fun fact, there is her teacher, Senora Olson, seen right there. Uh, she taught my wife Spanish as a high schooler at Kiwaskum High School. So I think Michaela is the first second generation Spanish student. And then the whole family went to a brewer game the Friday of Labor Day weekend. And then, of course, we're back to school. So we got back to school pictures for the boys and back to school pictures for my wife and the sisters. So we have an extra sister this year. We have a exchange student from China, same grade sophomore as my daughter. So um, it's been really fun so far. And there we'll go over to Brad. All right. So the Tesla went on its maiden journey around Lake Michigan. Um, you know, I'm a big fan, so I'm going to be a little bit biased. But we did, it does have a thing called camp mode, which would regulate the temperature in the fans so that if you sleep in it overnight that you're not going to like it's not going to sweat so we did sleep over in traverse city in a parking lot overnight and then the next night not so it did make it that was the picture from the first supercharger station it was a 22 minute charge got our coffee did, did a little walk next one's colin that's our last one uh he's a junior in high school he had to wait almost until school started because he's the youngest one, almost the youngest one in his grade, but he's driving now, so that's good. Uh, that's Colin playing football. Uh, right now he's off with the injury, getting, actually had the MRI today, we got, got in today. Uh, and then that's Logan, he came back from Colorado and played golf. And then our extra for the summer on the right was Francis, and then Colin and Ethan. So um, just having some fun in the summer. Good afternoon, my name is Cade, and I'm a client, uh, sorry about that, uh, client service specialist on the True Holistic planning team. And uh, a couple pictures up here, the first one on the far left is me and my girlfriend at the Port Washington uh, Lighthouse Tower. She's actually from St. Louis, so has never been up to the area, and she thought that area was like the coolest place ever, a lot better than the boring fields in Missouri. So that was a little better, and she had a good experience that. And a little um, exciting news with her is that she just got a job up here at ANSE, so she will be seeing her a lot more. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and then middle picture is, again, from our True Holistic outing at the Brewer game. That was fun. And then the picture on the far right is me and my buddy Luke at the Living Word golf outing. And then we can see the uh, client first sponsor pole down there. So that was a fun day. And I'm starting to miss that beautiful 80 degree weather. <laughs> I'm Dominique. I'm your client specialist team lead for the Trulistic team. Um, we had a really awesome summer. Um, we travel a lot to Indiana this summer where my husband works for Michaels on the pipeline. So he travels a lot. So spent most of our summer in Indiana. We also took a family trip to Fort Morgan, Alabama which was a lot of fun. Uh, my daughter is an avid gardener, so she loves to grow her own garden. So a picture of her with her radishes and her sweet peas. Um, uh, up in this far corner are a picture of my two girls along with my godchildren. Um, we just go up to Sparta, Wisconsin a lot during the summer as well and spend a lot of time up there with them. Um, my oldest got to experience her first uh, concert this summer. Uh, we went to Imagine Dragons, so that was a lot of fun to experience with her. And then the bottom picture is me and my husband at our nephew's wedding. Yes, I'm old enough to have a nephew that just got married. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our summer. Hello, I'm Katie Griefkiss. I am a client service specialist. Um, first picture, my cousin got married. So we were up in Appleton for a wedding this summer. 
um, top middle, my husband Joe and I went to Life Fest in Oshkosh, which is a whole weekend of Christian contemporary music, and it's wonderful and amazing. So we go there every year. Um, top side, my mom and my sister-in-law and I took a trip to South Carolina in June, which was beautiful. We've never been there, so we got to taste a lot of food and see a lot of beautiful scenery. Um, bottom middle, we got a puppy this summer. So that's like having a toddler again, which we were kind of done with, but she's very cute and she's a very sweet dog. And then um, back to school pictures, I have a seventh grader, a fifth grader, a third grader, and a first grader. So that was our summer. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Emily Zarling. Um, I'm helping with a lot of the administrative aspects of the Trollistic team. Some of you may recognize my husband, David, the cute bearded guy in the picture. Um, you probably have seen him up here before. Um, so this year we graduated our oldest from KML and over there we took him all to UW La Crosse. He's in his first year there and he's loving it so far. Um, and the summer we always go up north and this is what, like our classic family picture in front of the lake that we take every year. And then my whole fall and the next couple months is basically soccer with my three other kids. So that is a picture of them in their uniforms and that's pretty much what we do. Here we go, Brad, let's start the ball game. So we've got five innings to go through today. And what today is we're gonna go through uh, inning by inning, we're going to review the highlights of the recent tax law changes um, and what we think is most important for you to know. And then one modification from Eric's instructions, if you have questions, you can ask as we go. So if you had a question as we're going through, feel free to raise your hand and ask. So I'm going to kick it off with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, which went into effect, so it was signed in 2017 by President Trump, went into effect January 1st, 2018. Uh, so I love showing the initial promise with it was that you were gonna be able to file your taxes on a postcard. We know that's not true, but it's just fun to reminisce of fun pictures of the proposed tax, income tax return. So important things here. So uh, individual income tax rates were cut. The most notable ones the 15% bracket was cut down to 12, the 25 was cut down to 22. So the biggest percentage cut was 25, or I'm sorry, 15 to 12. So this is kind of comparing side by side what it was prior to the tax cut. And then here it's kind of listed out what the current tax brackets are at that time. Now they've indexed up for inflation a little bit since then. So to highlight like married filing joint, originally the first year uh, was 77,400, it's now up to 89,000 and Brad's got the current one there. So it's gone up for inflation. But as a reminder, in red, this um, tax law expires December 31st, 2025. We can go to the next one. Capital gains and qualified dividends. Uh, again, um, uh, uh, qualified gains and short-term um, capital gains, those fall through to your personal income tax. So those were cut from 15 to 12 and 25 to 22. Um, so those are lower currently. Again, they expire December 31st, 2025. Larger, on the right, larger standard deduction. Um, so prior you had smaller standard deductions and you had personal exemptions. A lot of people probably have already forgot about personal exemptions. So you got 4,000 per person in the household. Those will, if they do nothing, December 31st, 2025, that will all revert back if they do nothing. So it's kind of a theme here, December 31st, 2025. The other largest tax cut so similar to cutting 15% bracket down to 12, which is a 20% reduction. So pass-through income. So if you had income from a rental or you were a small business owner and you had a Schedule C um, and it came to your personal tax return, you got a 20% deduction. So this is just showing it graphically. 
Um, but that 20% pass-through income deduction, again, expires at the end of uh, 2025, December 31st. So some, um, something's going to happen with taxes in 2026. It'll either revert back or they might um, pass something that's completely different than what we know right now. All right, that takes us through Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017. All right, so now on to Secure Act 1.0. And we like to put some analogies in this, bringing in the reliever and situational baseball. So first talk about required minimum distributions, and I'm sure this is one point that a lot are familiar with. Um, required min minimum distributions are a required amount that must be withdrawn from an IRA in a given taxable year. And this amount is calculated by taking the prior amount from um, December 31st and calculated with a life expect expectancy number by our lovely friends at the IRS. So they um, basically telling you that um, you need to take your money. Um, and the minimum age under the Secure Act 1.0 has been moved from 70 and a half to 72 and then that number has also been changed just recently under the Secure Act 2.0 and we will cover that in a later slide <coughs> and um, under the required required minimum distributions there can be sent as uh, QCDs or qualified charitable distributions at the age of 70 and a half plus and that is a great way of using the tax advantage for that Question right over there. Yeah, does the money have to come from the IRA or can it come from anywhere else? For the R&D, it does have to come from that IRA. Clarification, it can come from IRAs can be aggregated. So if you have three IRAs, you could take all of the required distributions from one of those. It cannot be aggregated over to like a 401k. That has to be taken from that account. So a little bit different rules depending on what type of an account it's coming from. All right, and then now on to 529 education accounts. 529 plans are a state-sponsored college saving plan, and just recently those have become a lot more flexible, and we'll get into that. And so within those, they, more, they may provide a tax credit, um, including the American Opportunity and, and or lifetime learning tax credits. And I believe the American Opportunity tax credit is a maximum of 2500 and depending on um, adjusted gross income amounts, anything that needs to be under 80,000 filing single and 160,000 filing jointly. And then for the lifetime learning tax credit, that is a $2,000 tax credit every um, tax year. And the, um, the limits on that is 90,000 filing single and 180,000 finally jointly. And so within these 529 plans, if those withdrawals were taken for non-qualified -quali expenses, and we'll go through those um, down there, there is a 10% penalty on top of income taxes for that. And the nice thing about them at the bottom here is they you may um, change beneficiaries as well as combined 529 plans. And so let's talk about some ways to use them. Um, one of the nice ways to use them is um, we all know that student loans can get up there, can be pricey. So the nice way is that we can use 10000 total per student to pay back student loans. And then one of the, the other more common ways to use them are enrollment at college, university, or any other eligible educational institutions like trade school. And examples include room and board, maybe a laptop, books and supplies, and then also $10,000 per year for K through 12 tuition. And so none, some of the non-qualified 529 expenses include transportation and travel costs, college applications and testing fees, or extracurricular activities like uh, clubs or intramural sports. So one of the new things in Secure Act 1.0 was the student loan provision. In the past, you were kind of stuck. Like if you're, um, you could only change beneficiaries. That was kind of your only flexibility in them. So it's there. We have some other updates in 2.0, but the ability to be able to pay off student loans is something that was new in the Secure Act 
And then this, we wanted to throw some more baseball um, analogies in here. So I'm actually going to bring in my relief pitcher, Justin, and he is going to go over the inherited IRAs. So this is probably the biggest impact or single item that impacts the most people in this Cure Act 1.0. So in the past, if you were uh, the beneficiary of an IRA, you had a certain list of options that you could do. If you were a spouse, you could just take it over as your own IRA, or if you were a non-spouse, so if Brad inherited an IRA from one of his parents or another um, non-spouse, he could then open up a beneficiary IRA. And the rules prior to this law were he had to take distributions every single year based on his life expectancy. So that has changed with Secure Act 1.0. So they still left this option available for eligible designated beneficiaries, those being any of your minor children, disabled persons, chronically ill, um, uh, people not more than 10 years younger than you, spouses and in certain trusts. So again, the most, most people would fall into spouse or minor children beneficiaries. So they still have those options to stretch those distributions out over their entire uh, lifespan. The biggest people now that um, fall into the new rules are, so non-spouse beneficiaries, so you'd be a designated beneficiary. So now if I, Brad inherited that account from a parent, now he falls under the new 10 year rules. So he <clears throat> would have to take all of the money out of that account, whether it be an IRA or Roth IRA, within 10 years of the year following of that account owner passing away. So we will get into further updates on that in Secure Act 2.0 because there was questions in the IRS of how this exactly was going to work. But for now, let's leave it at non-spouse beneficiaries now have to completely deplete the account in 10 years. That's the takeaway. All right, so I know it can be sometimes kind of confusing to understand inherited IRAs just talking about it. So we went to get, we went ahead and put together a case study that we can look at actual numbers and see how that can be distributed. So here's our case study. Bill earns $70,000 per year and is age 59. He inherits his mom's IRA with a balance of 200000 How should Bill take distributions from the inherited IRA? So I would ask the question, kind of give you some trivia, but the answers are laid out there. So we like to say strikeout swinging is kind of the worst option that you can take. Bill cashes out a lump sum and pays all the tax at once. Hitting a single, which is kind of good, you know, there's some benefits to that. Bill takes an annual annual distribution of 80 28000 to help pay for trips with the kids. And the Grand Slam option, was, which is the best, is Bill, ta Bill delay delays taking any distributions. He continues to work and then retires at age 65. Once retired, he uses the inherited money to fund his retirement until age 70 when he can turn on Social Security at the maximum benefit. And so this next slide, we put together a small table just so that we can see the numbers and see how different it can, it can be. So on the far left here, we can see all the numbers for the lump sum distribution. And in this option, we can see that um, there's a good amount of tax being paid and also the least amount of cash balance that you are getting at the end. And then the 28,000 annual distribution and this as well as the delayed is assuming a 6% rate of return. This is paying the most amount of tax but also getting a good amount of cash value um, at the end of those. And then the delayed distribution, which is the best, we are paying the least amount of tax as well as letting that account grow and giving us a much higher um, final balance at the end. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, does he have to take the 10 year rule with this? He, if he, he gets it at 59. Does that mean by 69 he has to take all of it and, and it's gone? So the, the question was <clears throat> does this use the 10 year rule? And so, yes, it does. Um, it's a 10 year rule. And as Justin had said, so age 59, he inherits it. He has to use it up in 10 years following the year after death. So he gets it from 60 to 70. That's the way we designed the case study. And a little bit, so 
on your table, just to help you understand maybe this table here, so you see the tax rate. So in that whole lump sum distribution, he took $200,000 and it went, um, so it, the, the blue one is the one that's probably the most interesting. So he makes 70000 he gets a, let's just call it a standard deduction of 15000 So he's already at, his, his blue line's already at 55000 and then he adds two hundred thousand dollars to that, pushing him into the thirty. Some of that money is being taxed at thirty-two percent. That's why that tax rate, tax paid, is so much. Um, the second scenario is kind of more of a level distribution, but since he's already making fifty-five thousand a year, he's in the twenty-two percent bracket for every one of those distributions. And in that case, you know, the reason he's getting more cash is because he's getting a a rate of growth, like again, rate, you know, the market doesn't go up 6% every year, but we just have, just did something from an illustration perspective to have a constant variable. And then the last one is that whole, like, for six years, he's not touching that money and it's going up. Again, Secure Act 1.0, no required minimum distribution because he's below that age. And then he's basically turning off income and now paying tax at 10 and 12% until, you know, he moves up into the 22% bracket. So you guys, if you've met with me before, you know I love the tax table, so I just wanted to give a little background on that for you. So the last two things on that is, I don't know if it was just by coincidence, used 859, but it brought up, don't confuse 59 and 59 and a half. 59 and a half only applies to your individual IRA and the access to it. It has nothing to do with beneficiary IRAs. So common, don't mix those two up. Um, and then the interesting thing about beneficiary IRAs is this is Bill's beneficiary IRA. He might have had a sister, Sally. She might have picked something different. So each beneficiary can pick what's in their best best interest. Yep, yep. that's why, you know, just giving you that uh, background. All right, so the next inning is all about the Inflation Reduction Act. So let's just get out of this inning, you know, I, was passed. I don't know what benefits actually came from it, but there's a few. So uh, the the one the, the biggest thing would be these these clean energy credits. So the the water heater is six hundred dollar credit. Um, the windows and skylights is six hundred dollars, and then two fifty for an exterior door and five hundred for all exterior doors. But a lot of that gets clustered into like a, a maximum $1,200 annual amount that you can use. And this is a tax credit based on 30% of your installation cost. So um, this is new from, I think the old one was, was it 300 life or 500 lifetime? It was 500 or 600 lifetime. So this is six depending on the category 1200 or 600 every year per category so starting in 2023 so it's definitely an enhancement going forward yep so this is something to take advantage of uh, and then the last one being the uncapped limit of solar energy uh, basically installed between now and, and like 2033 30 percent of project cost so regardless of what um you know that that cost is there's no cap on that that specific one so Brad will talk as we go forward. He'll talk about his Tesla case. The, I actually took advantage of this one this year. I put a new high efficiency water heater in. That one I see as the six hundred out. It's probably going to be the most used in the masses. You know, not everybody is going to buy a Tesla. He'll talk about you know why it might make sense for you. Um, but the water heater one is one where you know it's definitely you want to look for it if you put a new water heater and. I think the plumbers and other installers are getting more information on this, but it's really, you want to look at, you know, what makes sense at time of installation, like the life of it, and just, you know, what credits you're getting at that. So Right, yeah, there's different ratings and everything that, that apply to a lot of these credits, but we're just giving you kind of the broad stroke um, overview. So what I did here is, you know, let we had a bunch of, Situations here in Jackson, for you know, many of you had you know siding being replaced or a roof. Maybe you thought maybe I should replace my windows as well. So George and Sue did two thousand dollars worth of windows this year, thirty percent of two thousand six hundred dollars. So they'd get a six hundred dollar credit. They didn't do four thousand because they'd be capped out of that window credit. So then the next year they went and went with the water heater. 
the exterior door, um, and then a little more windows to get the $1,200 credit because that's the way that that piece works with the $1,200 maximum per year. And then the third year, uh, they did another $2,000 worth of windows. So breaking up those projects um, it is you know, a way to take advantage of those credits each year, whereas in the past, once you hit your lifetime max, it didn't matter. Electric vehicles also, they this, uh, I want to think maybe t seven, eight, nine years ago when that Chevy Volt came out, they, they had this big $7,500 tax credit, and then it, it just seemed to, kind of, to, to, to go away for a bit. So they brought that back in. 3750 of that is meeting the critical min mineral sourcing and battery component sourcing requirements. The other 3750 is final assembly in the United States. Now they didn't exclude used vehicles in this, but the used vehicle has to be purchased from a dealership and has to be sticker priced what you pay for it less than 25,000. I haven't found one yet on the lot, so we'll see, but that's a $4,000 tax credit um, as well. So these these are two things that come up. Now, one catch on that is the $7,500 $7, tax credit is a credit, meaning I have to have tax liability to get that credit. If I don't, I and I don't use it up, it's not carried forward like a capital loss or, um, you know, some of those others. It's not refundable, meaning, like, you don't get 7500 if you don't have 7500 in liability. So just know that. And then there are income limits, $3,000 married filing joint and one fifty single. So adjusted gross income. So I did, I did purchase one. I, I talked about it last time. Enough people asked me, so I did want to just put that in there because people might want to know what was it like, um, you know, what's this program about, etc. So I bought the Tesla Model 3 rear wheel drive. The range is 272 miles. That's the EPA estimation. As everyone knows, EPA estimates are probably higher than reality, but that's what it is. Um, sticker price around 38350 is the sticker price of the vehicle you add in. I think it's a $1,300 delivery fee and whatever your sales tax is. Um, and you can take that off the lot in about 10 minutes is about how long it took me to take delivery of my vehicle. Um, so that is a, that's $41,000 uh, with taxes, titles, and fees. I'm, I'm able to get the $7,500 tax credit, so I'm counting on that. And then I, I had an Acura MDX, um, and it was $7,500 I sold that for. So I'm taking my own situation and saying, I've got 26000 built into the cost of my vehicle. Now, what's it costing me? So I love the car. I'm driving 2,500 miles per month. Um, I'm on the We Energies EV charging program. I bought a $630 juice box, it's called. It's, it hangs in the garage, plugs in through a 220 adapter, and it plugs into my car. It, it doesn't turn on until 12.15 a.m., and it turns off by 7.45 a.m. That's off-peak charging. Your normal uh, rate of electricity is 16.7 cents. At night, you get half off, so it's 8 cents per kilowatt hour. What's a kilowatt hour? I don't know, but that's what I pay. Um, I got my first bill for 2,500 miles worth of driving, and I paid $55 for that amount of um, energy. Okay, so I have a $10 rental fee or, you know, the ability to be on this off-peak program, and then that's basically what I paid. So that's where I'm at. So, again, I have to justify my own purchases. If I had my MDX and it was getting 18 miles per gallon, it would at $4 a gallon because I, I was in the middle, I was in the premium gas, so I'm just taking a blended rate. That would have cost, those same miles would have cost me $555 in gas. That's pretty much the point where I was at when I bought this car. So I was so irritated how much I was spending on gas just to run this thing around. And now it's 55 So I said, hey, for $500 savings a month, how fast can I pay off, you know, that vehicle? So I feel like in my case, it's four years and four months. So that's, you know, just giving you an illustration of kind of how this thing goes. Um, but I'm not, I try not to be persuasive. Obviously I love it. It's really fun, but the, then 
I did some searching of other people who kind of like look at this and say, okay, what's the five-year cost of ownership? I just went with the five-year cost of usage because if my vehicle depreciates at, you know, this to this and a, d a different car, to, you know, they're, they're fairly similar. I'm not too worried about that. But what do I have to put in for maintenance? And then what do I have to put in to put the vehicle on the road and move it around? So I just ran kind of that old MDX. What do it cost me? Like, a, um, you know, Cade's a big fan of the Honda Accord at 33 miles per gallon. That's basically just saying, all right, it doesn't matter what the car costs. Um, it's a, you know, it's a higher mile per gallon vehicle or um, the Tesla. So there is um, facts that a Tesla doesn't have as much maintenance. I don't have an oil change I have to do, and I don't have to do brakes for probably maybe 150,000 because as I take my foot off the gas, it stops. It's called regenerative braking. So, um, so a lot of that maintenance goes away. Basically, I just pay for tires. So they do say it's about half of that cost. I'm on forums with people who have like 200, 250,000 miles on them, and they've, it's been pretty accurate for that. So, and then I assumed all home charging. So just kind of an illustration of what's possible. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. So again, I, I will tell you, um, Tesla has their own insurance and, and some of these people on the forum are on that and it's based on driving habits and they're getting inflated rates outside of our state. People, some people are paying up to like 150 or 200 a month. Now, you know, my insurance team's back there. I'm a good driver. So, um, obviously my MDX was, you know, very low in, in value it was maybe a $10,000 vehicle. So I think I was paying 400 and now I'm paying more like eight or 900 for the vehicle with, um, I have full replacement cost in case something happens because it's hard to get parts and it's very easy to total it out. So um, that's about where I'm at. So, so it's, more. it's more, but I, I can't say it's more than if I would have bought a Honda Accord that was new versus anything. So I think it's comparable, maybe a couple hundred dollars more, but not not a couple thousand like I'm hearing on some other forums. So I think in the great state of Wisconsin, we've got decent um, insurance carriers that aren't gouging us, you know, for at this point. But it could go up because I don't see as many cars here as I do everywhere else. How long is the battery supposed to last? <laughs> My battery is supposed to last the life of the vehicle and or like 200,000 miles. And again, with some of these examples, the guy got 250,000 kilometers and still is on the original set of batteries. So again, we don't know, but that's what... Are they going to raise the, the registration fee because you don't pay any road tax? Yes, I pay an extra $100 a year for uh, my road tax for my registration, yep. You're welcome, Brad. Yeah, yeah. I, apparently, that's less than what the gas people pay, but I don't know. I just, I just used to fill up with gas. Now I fill up with electricity. We pay. So thank you, everyone, for helping out sub sub my subsidies. But um, I'm I'm kind of a technology semi leader. You know, I like to just test the stuff out and then see where it, how it's going. So next thing, Secure Act 2.0, uh, designated and pinch hitters. So Secure Act 2.0 came out in January of this year, and the big thing was changing the required minimum distribution age from the, what, you, you changed it to 72, Cade, right, in 1.0, and now they changed it to this. 19, if your birth year is 1951 to 59, it's now 73, and then 1960 plus, it's now going to be 75. And that did change that life expectancy table just a bit because I, you know, I love to run calculations, so I've got all those numbers. Um, the other thing, I don't know, but you, you see this sole spousal beneficiary options. So, again, with Justin had talked a little bit about the 10-year rule non-spousal, right? But if you do have a, if you're a spouse and you're, um, your spouse dies and, and you're inheriting their IRA, this is the gate chart that you would work with us through to determine what your best option is. Any commentary on that, Justin? There's a lot of options. <laughs> That's why you come here. There's, there's no rules of thumb with that chart. 
Yeah, there's it's a lot of factors, you know, because same age, spread in age, you know, are you 10 years younger? There's a lot of things to think through. So uh, just a little bit of a preview of what we do. Um, Non-spousal options for IRA uh, just talks a little bit more um, about like a required, uh, what do they call it now? It's So it's RBD. Required. So, required beginning date? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, required beginning, beginning date of RMD. So a lot of it matters about if the um, if the person that's inheriting it had, you know, had, they've already taken, uh, they were starting their required minimum distributions, or if it hadn't been at that point, there's some new options there. And then um, the third bullet point, so there is a ruling. So again, we had talked about, you know, my, my the case study of the person waiting six years and not touching the IRA. Uh, the third bullet point says there, there is a preliminary ruling uh, in 2024 that single life expectancy RMD may need to be taken, meaning not the equivalent of a tenth of the um, IRA balance, but like a, a life expectancy. So I try and help people understand. So if I'm age 72, life expectancy table number for that is 25%. Point six or so. So basically take the balance and take 4%. That's what you would have to take if you're age 72. And then it just keeps going up a little or down a little bit from there. So I don't know if it was in the forties, maybe. So maybe like two and a half percent is what, you know, someone my age would have to take two and a half percent out each year, but fully exhausted by the end of 10 years. Do I confuse you enough yet? Yeah. So this is proposed so they proposed it for 23, and then they say, we're halfway through the year. Well, we're not going to we're not gonna enforce this for 23, and now they're, it seems like it's, it'll probably happen in 24, but they haven't decided for sure, because it's interpretation of the law that was passed. So, so this potentially will redefine, because we were working, the last two years, we were working under the assumption that you had to, if you're beneficiary IRA, non-spouse beneficiary, you could you just had to take it all within 10 years of the year after the person passed away. So all the financial planners and tax people interpreted that as like, we have complete flexibility. We can take it. We can let it sit for five years and take it out over the last five. Now they're coming back and saying, huh, you might have to take some distributions each year. You could always take more, um, but they're still deciding this. So we're just kind of waiting. But we feel confident from the IRS um, guidance that none of this applies for 23. So we're just going to wait and see what they decide. That's why you keep coming to the Lunch and Learns. Keep keep up to date on all of this information as it changes. Um, we're always plugged into it. So I think now uh, I need a pinch hitter for this 529 contribution thing. I, I hope there's someone who's got expertise. All right, so we're going to circle back to 529 contributions and how they can relate to the Roth IRA. So this um, this is something new with the Secure Act 2.0 and is becoming effective in 2024. So 529 contributions can actually be rolled over into a Roth IRA, but the uh, beneficiary must have earned income or any form of compensation. Um, that account also have, must have been open for 15 years, and the contributions and earnings in the last five years are ineligible. So if money was put into it um, within that five years, that is not um, yet eligible to roll over into that Roth, Roth IRA. <clears throat> and um, the maximum lifetime transfer to a beneficiary is 35000 so if it was at let's say forty thousand, then thirty-five thousand can be rolled over, but that last five thousand has to be used um, according to the five twenty-nine rules. And then um, these are subject to IRA or Roth IRA contribution limits. So for say example, Roth IRA sixty-five hundred or seventy-five hundred over the age of fifty, and then they are not subject to Roth IRA income limits. <clears throat> Like I said, this is effective starting in 2024, 
and these must go directly from a 529 into a Roth IRA. They can't jump around in separate accounts. In, in my opinion, this pinch hitter hit a grand slam with these because this has always been a concern. You know, what if what if my son or daughter is a plumber, electrician, goes in the military, whatever it is, and they don't go to college? Well, this is this is, in my opinion, one of the the best things they did in this tax law because now they can take that money right to a Roth IRA later in life and keep it in tax free and grow for their retirement. So this is really good that they changed this. All right, good job, Kate. The case study that I, we've got for Secure Act 2.0, again, you're going to love all the details going on here, but uh, it's just to bring home this point. So many of you uh, may have uh, IRAs that, that you're taking distributions from, and the beneficiaries after your spouse is going to go to um, your, your children. So now this is a little bit more of a tragic situation, just to help you uh, illustrate a point. So Bill and Sally pass away unexpectedly at age 48. Uh, they have one child, Max, who's age 17. Uh, what is the age of majority in the state of Wisconsin? Meaning, when is someone fully uh, able, uh, uh, I guess I don't know exactly what, but age of majority is a term that's out there. Some may say, you know, 18, uh, but it's actually 21. So that's the age of majority. So... The required minimum distribution is going to be based on single life expectancy from age 18 to 21, meaning he's got a small amount he's going to have to take out. And then Max has to, from age 22, he's got 10 years to fully distribute that IRA. So whether or not you wanted it to happen or not, he's going to have to use that money for something. So what I did here is just kind of laid that out in an even distribution formula just to give you a sense of the kind of money that's going to go through his hands and and the taxes that he would pay. So the balance starts at 300. We make an you know a modest six percent. We're just make, give, using an average assumption there. So the first couple of years, he's got an RMD to the two you know like four thousand dollars that he has to pay tax on. You know if he's working or not. You know whatever. That's that's how this works. Then I just said, we're going to take, and there's a 10-year burndown uh, rule that, you know, we're used to. It's like a, a tenth, then the next year you take a ninth, an eighth, all the way down to taking the final one over one. So you basically divide by the number kind of the way through. So I just took the balance all the way through, and that's the, his annual gross income without working that Max would get and then just showed you kind of the taxes, the inheritance, and how much cash you would get. So this is just an example of what would happen, um, you know, with an IRA to someone who's, you know, 10 years more uh, younger in an in unfortunate situation. Uh, we've, and, you know, Brad just sketched this out, but this, the reality of this is you put together a, you know, a 10 or 12 year sketch, but it's going to require annual maintenance because... He's probably working, so you want to be, you know, you might run it up to the top of a tax bracket for him one year, might get married, tax bracket might change, so it's going to be individual to each one. So we've ran into situations where we're helping um, families plan, and sometimes we run into trustees even who are like, hey, can we just cash this account out and, like, I want to finish this, get it off my plate, and we've come back and said, hey, we want to make sure we're doing what's in the best interest of each beneficiary. This person might want to cash out. This person might want to stretch over 10 years. So it's it's an individualized plan for each one. Yep, good point. All right, so I'm going to kick this off, and then service team is going to go through. So we've got, you can go to the next one. So we got uh, the, the uh, TD Ameritrade to Schwab merger. So about four years ago, Schwab purchased TD Ameritrade, and then COVID just kind of happened right in the middle there. So the planning for the merger just kind of came to a standstill. Uh, and then they continued going forward with planning. So that took place over Labor Day weekend. And uh, it's been pretty smooth for the most part. So it's it's if Apple bought Samsung is my uh, analogy I like using. So it's two very big platforms merging. Um, so TD Ameritrade, um, it had a cool history of how it was started. Um, and so... 
a lot of what the, they provide is very similar. Um, so Dom and Katie will kind of walk through and give updates on some of our frequently asked questions. So my frequently asked question was, hey, why did you do this or why was this? They purchased one company and merged them together. So what was included in the automatic Schwab transfer over Labor Day weekend? Uh, we had 10 years of history and documents came over. So if you've been clients with us for at least 10 years, all that information came over. <laughs> Most standing move money instructions used in the last three years. Um, so if you had uh, banking information, that all came over with your account. So we have that on file. Uh, cost basis and tax information, paperless preferences, your beneficiary designations, so whoever you have for beneficiaries, TOD, transfers on death, your, tra your trust, those all came over onto your accounts, uh, voting preferences, and uh, advisor authorizations. So move money, um, and then trading and investment management um, that we have our adaptive team do for you guys on your accounts. So what is the Schwab equivalent of the TD Ameritrade client portal? Um, so now you probably have gotten some mail in before Labor Day weekend um, saying, hey, switch over to the Schwab Alliance. Um, so if you haven't done that or you have questions on that, feel free to call our office. We can help you guys get set up on that. Um, and then you can also create one login and view um, all your accounts in one household. So um, if you're married and you want to see your husband and your wife, we can set that all up on one household now. Um, will the client first portal be changing? So we also have our client first portal as well. Um, our online portal is staying the same. Um, you'll still be able to see and view all the history for your accounts on that one portal. And then will clients TD Ameritrade account numbers change? Yes. So your account, you should have gotten a letter in the mail from Schwab before Labor Day weekend stating that you do have a new account with Schwab. Um, if you do not if you did not get that or did not see that, just feel free to give our office a call and we'd be more than happy to share that account number with you. Okay, then we have, what is the difference between Schwab Digital Onboarding and DocuSign? So we just talked about Schwab Alliance kind of replacing your TD Ameritrade online portal. So that's called the Schwab Alliance and that can be used as a digital workflow to approve and sign applications or make other changes. So you would log into the Schwab Alliance, and there you could view ap applications or make changes, and you would do that. And then DocuSign is, is another um, digital platform we use to have clients sign forms that we need to submit on your behalf. And there's two authentication methods involved in that, and that's SMS text messaging and knowledge-based questions. So this is something that will come to you through your email from DocuSign, and you would simply sign your name and date. And just to make one note, if you're still coming into the office, we're still doing wet side yes. measures, um, everything like that. So um, if uh, digital or DocuSign is not your cup of tea, we'll still get you a wet sign. That's okay. And then Schwab Advisor Center requires two authentication methods when using DocuSign. What are they? We just talked about them. So that's the knowledge-based authentication. That's going to be questions about your past, like what was your the color of your 1995 Ford you drove. So they're going to ask you questions, and sometimes they trick you, and there's no right answer in there. So just have to watch those questions. And then the SMS text message, they'll just send you a text and give you a code to enter so that they can just verify that it is actually you answering these questions. And then true or false, clients must provide a voided check to set up new move money instructions on their accounts. And that is true. So we did talk about if you had existing move money instructions on your accounts, those did transfer over. But say you want to add a bank on an existing account or you're opening a new account and you would like to put move money instructions on there, you do need to bring a voided check to sign your papers. So this next slide is more towards um, if you're doing a rollover or a transfer. Um, when is the deadline for Schwab to accept checks that are made out to TD Ameritrade? So it's 90 days post-conversion and um, July. So if you had uh, a rollover or a transfer that has not come through yet, we still have till July if it's labeled TD Ameritrade to uh, be associated with your TD Ameritrade account. And that will flow right over into Schwab. And then um, if your distribution requires more cash than your account currently holds, how long will it take to get my money? So a lot of um, our clients call in for distributions, um, you know, 
for this or for that. Um, the process of raising that cash and distributing to your bank account usually takes about five to seven business days. So just remember, you know, we're not a bank, so it's just more or less we have to call in, we have to get that cash liquidated for you to be able to get you that distribution um, process for you. All right. <clears throat> so we just wanted to, uh, if I think it was last year around this time, we had the, the student loan forgiveness coming up as a as a you know a big topic out there. So they that didn't go through, but they have a lot of these income based student loan repayment programs. We covered it at nauseum. What they did here is they put in a new program called SAVE, Saving on a Valuable Education. Um, and basically what they did, and, and you know, we will breeze through this pretty easily. So the repayee program was just another option that was out there. That was, you know, based on this, what's called discretionary income. Basically, adjusted gross income minus a percentage of the federal poverty rate equals discretionary income, and then you take a percentage of that. So now they've moved it to 225% of poverty, and an undergraduate loan would be 5% of discretionary, and a graduate would be 10% of discretionary, and they would give you 25 years of consistent payments, and then the, anything left on the balance would be forgiven. They're also like, so if the case is, let's say you have $400 in interest, but your income, this um, payment program only has you paying $200, that other $200 used to be added to the loan, that no longer happens under this repayment program. So that's a little bit of how they've done a little bit of forgiveness, you know, just in, in getting there. So just to be aware of that, um, so this is, you know, some of the details around what was repayee versus save. And this is the big mega chart. If you have someone who's in a student loan, just have them contact us, you know, if, if you're a client, because it's, it's, there's five different options and it all depends on, you know, income you have now, income you have in the future, are you married, are you single, uh, a lot of different things. So one, this is just, and then this is a, um, kind of a use case, right? So Max is a single filer. What would he pay under the SAVE program versus repayee? Um, so you can see it's a considerable savings on his monthly payment versus the repayee. Uh, but always know that student loan forgiveness is taxable as ordinary income in the year it's forgiven. Uh, certain states are still, you know, making some of that taxable. So, you know, again, everything is a situation that we've got to talk through. We just started one or two, or we've just started kind of running the numbers for clients on this one. So kind of the verdict's kind of out is how many people are going to be able to utilize it. We'll be available for questions or right up against one o'clock. So I'm going to have Eric take us home at the end here, but we'll be available. All right. Thank you. Let's give him a hand here. Um, so just a few things before we close out on the tables. There are some surveys, so if you could please fill that out, give us some feedback. We appreciate it. Let us know how we can help. Uh, the, the next, our next event, one of the, there's two more, and it's the Q, uh, Q4 market update, or market insights with our adaptive team. It's going to be on Wednesday, October 19th, same time, same place, and in the evening as well. So um, and here's that team. Uh, so mark your calendars. We also have some new team members. They're not here, but uh, one is uh, Jessica Zarling. She's on our insurance team and uh, has been on our team for about a month. So she's great. Many of you may know her, and you may be hearing from her if you're with our agency. Uh, Jeremy uh, Tank, Tank, you saying that right? He's on our accounting team, our accounting intern. So uh, those are two two newest uh, additions. And then lastly. Remember, you know, if you aren't part of our family yet, you know, feel free to reach out. There's a free initial uh, no-fee consultation so you can learn what we're about, and we'd love to have you. Um, so come on and uh, ask us any questions that you have afterwards. So thanks again for coming.